Hello and welcome back to the History Machine podcast and this is episode 7 on the Persians. So if you're not really familiar with our podcast, feel free to go back and listen to some of the earlier episodes. But here's a brief summary of what we are involved with. We have a neural network that is nicknamed the History Machine, which is an artificial intelligence that crunches a database of historical battles that include most battles up until the year 0 AD. And then using that information, the neural network is able to make predictions, put some stats on battles, warriors, commanders, armies and units. So as you say, it's trained on this database of historical battles. And from that, it has built up a picture of what should have happened in each of these battles. You know, what what odds each general, each army should have had going into it. And then it compares that with what actually happened. And based on that, it gives us stats on each historical general and how good they were, how much they won above expectation, mm-hmm. how many more casualties they dealt out versus expectation, how fewer casualties they took below expectation. And from this, we can make some kind of stab at who was the best and worst. Okay, brilliant. So for this episode, we're going to talk about the Persians, particularly the Achaemenid Persians. Now, unfortunately for us, we don't actually have too much data on the Persians in general. We do have one standout figure, Cyrus the Great, but we'll come to him in a moment. But to talk about the Achaemenid Persians, we really have to talk about ancient civilization in general, like Babylon, Mesopotamia, Egypt, these regions, just to get an understanding of what exactly was going on and what is it like at the cradle of civilization. So to start, I'm just going to give a little bit of information about Mesopotamia, which is Greek, meaning the land between two rivers. And in this case, it's a city between the river Tigris and the Euphrates. It's the first known complex civilization. We get the world's first epic, the legend of Gilgamesh, who's two thirds god, one third man. Work out the math somehow that way. People specialise, things get more complex, we start seeing like, you know, wealth gaps, we start seeing power gaps. Uh, now, not to say that ancient man, we really have this down as like, you know, what what were the early hunter-gatherers like? We don't really know too much about their culture, but this is where we really start to see like recording and history. So for a little bit of a brief background about Mesopotamia and areas like it, like Babylon and Egypt... You can look at a world that's a civilization in trade and export. So there's an intricate level of connectivity of goods and services from different civilizations around this area at the time. Centuries of trade, war, peace. Culture just gets to advance. You've got huge trades in things like copper, uh, tin, bronze, pottery, even slaves. So all of these things are bought and sold and traded among early civilizations. Most of them are established by having a large city on or near a river. These civilizations are complex and trading and something particularly bad happens, the Bronze Age collapse. So seemingly out of nowhere, a group of people who are known as the Sea Peoples raid and destroy most complex societies. They could have been a bunch of disgruntled mercenaries. They could have been a new, unknown, different civilization. No one is really sure, but a near complete destruction of most early civilizations happens. And it's after this where the ashes pick up that we're going to have a particular civilization that we've mentioned before when we were talking about the Carthaginians and talking about the Greeks, and it will be the Phoenicians. Now, the Phoenicians bring us a lot of really interesting things. They bring us writing, but not just regular writing, it's phonetic writing, and that spreads like wildfire. And because we got writing, then we have records, and because we have records, we're able to have records of things like battles, and that gives us our database. Funny fact about the Phoenicians, they are effectively a civilization of middlemen, They're the ancestors of the Carthaginians, so think of Hannibal Barca. Uh, They also brought us the colour purple in terms of uh, they used to laboriously get a mucus from a sea snail and they would use that to dye clothes and people would recognise that these guys, the Phoenicians, they're the purple men. They're the guys if you want to get purple. So think royal purple, that really strong shade. These are the guys who popularised it. These are the guys who traded in it. So... The Phoenicians really take centre stage for a certain amount of time in terms of trade and writing, but one particular civilization that doesn't particularly exist anymore, there are people who would claim descendancy from them, but they're a big, huge deal in the ancient world, and these are the Assyrians. The Assyrians are the guys who established the Machiavellian idea of it's better to be feared than loved. They're an early civilization. They're an early militaristic civilization, but they set the bar for just how empire works and how you're meant to govern other nations. They are absolutely draconian. Um, 
they are skewed incredibly far towards the better to be feared than loved in the Machiavellian attitude. They're infamous for the amount of punishments and for the destruction that they bring about people around them. They starved millions of people with a scorched earth policy. They are literally biblical in terms of their punishments. They flayed enemies alive. They paraded around with necklaces of severed kings. Uh, They even have a word for like shock and awe, melamu. So it, the translation of that is like it's the shining radiance that flashes from a king. <laughs> but effectively, it's it's I want you to be absolutely so shocked and appalled that uh, you're 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 completely cowed. Uh, they innovated lots of siege engines. They had notoriously good infantry. Uh, they're a war based economy. They raided and plundered loads of smaller societies. For an example, actually, I have some figures here of the loot that they got from sacking a settlement. And they got 5,000 sheep, 2,000 cattle, 360 horses, 40 chariots, silver, gold and iron in various weight quantities and literally, literally a ton of copper, plus some ivory and 15,000 slaves. So this was one raid where they might average 15 to 20 a year. So you think a war-based economy, you think of something that like is going to survive on just raiding and destroying its neighbours. You wouldn't be far off thinking some kind of walking dead situation where you've got the group of people who have a decent army and they just raid their neighbours and take all of their stuff. So even with all of that in mind and the amount of resources they've raided, they traded very heavily with the Phoenicians, uh, particularly for Phoenician wood and for silver. The first ever silver inflation, or possibly the first ever inflation, happened. This is an unknown phenomenon at the time. And uh, the Assyrians would absorb the Phoenicians by the 8th century BC, but not before getting the Phoenicians to mine so much silver that several million tons of slag will be left in Spain, and the value of silver will be equal the value of copper. So, um, (laughs) So if you really want to put in perspective, the Assyrians are, they're draconian. Funnily enough, like 2,000 years later, Spain itself would create its own silver inflation when they took as much as they could from South America all in one go. So it's just interesting that the silver started out there and then 2,000 years later, their country did the same stupid thing. But anyway, I digress. <laughs> yeah. So the Assyrians exist pretty much in a, in a combination of different forms, almost unbroken for 2,000 years. They're pretty much the defining culture. They are the biggest kids in the playground. They've absorbed other societies. They rule by absolute shock, awe and fear. And they rule for about 2,000 years. In 1612 BC, after a very long siege, a combination of rebellious Babylonians under King Nabopolassar and a Median king, Saraxes, and some Scythians, who would be horse archers, effectively destroy the Assyrians at the height of their power, suddenly and unexpectedly, in the Siege of Nineveh. Now, this is going to be, and I've thought about this for quite a while, and Cahal, you can probably agree with me, but it would be the modern day equivalent of, of as if Christianity just disappeared this time next year. So you're like, it's been around for about 2,000 years, it's changed here and there, it's been fairly much a constant in culture, and it's gone. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. It's over. Yeah, it's it's pretty dramatic. And it is it is crazy. Like, as you say, like the scale of this civilization, you talk about, you know, like surviving for 2000 years, you know, comparable to Egypt. But again, we have to go back to writing stuff down is so important if you want to get remembered. And, you know, when it's that far back, like you have to be writing down so much so consistently and so much of it can get lost if you're not really consistent and so the Phoenicians are not significant, but middlemen, they have lots of admin. They write their stuff down. Yeah. Now, funnily enough, the Assyrians will have like carved reliefs. So they'll, they'll carve stuff in stone, but unfortunately it won't really be writing. Uh, we could sit in that for a moment because there could be a heavy chance that they did have a lot of writing about their accomplishments and their battles and their numbers and figures. But the sacking of Nineveh is so completely total when the Babylonians and the Medes and the Scythians join together to destroy the Assyrians, that there's a good chance a lot of those records are destroyed. So similar to Alexander the Great burning Persia later and uh, Caesar destroying the Library of Alexandria, there possibly were records that did exist or continued to exist and we just have a cutoff point where they don't anymore. And that's just, uh, just really unfortunate for us because pretty much for our database, we need those kind of figures to make these kind of predictions. So unfortunately, we don't actually have enough data on almost any Assyrian ruler just to say if they were that bloodthirsty 
if they were that draconian. We just don't know the initial figures, the final figures and the casualties. So because we don't have that information, we can't really make predictions on them. But it's critical to know that they were around at this time. Even to not mention them would be a sin. It is kind of funny. One of the few things that we do seem to know a good bit about is their insanely cruel punishment. So it's almost like maybe the ones who did, you know, rise up and take them out, just wanted us to remember, you know, just kind of make us think they had it coming a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, I don't want to have the Assyrians put into too bad of a light because effectively they've had a lot of draconian policies, but the day-to-day Assyrians aren't particularly that bad because funnily enough, we don't have a lot of military records, but we do have a lot of merchant messaging. So this is like a message that we put on a tablet that would be sent to somebody you know, hundreds of miles away. So I've got a couple of examples and I just want to mention them because they're quite entertaining. So a first one here is a letter looking for love and it's, quote, I'm alone here. There is no one who serves me or dresses my table for me. Your father wrote to me about you proposing that I should marry you. If you do not come, I will marry a girl from Washunana. So uh, not really too patient, but the idea is uh, that would be a personal ad. We have another one here for a wife who is arranged to meet her husband and, quote, You went to Ganesh and told me I will stay there for 15 days. But instead of 15 days, you stay for a full year. From Ganesh, you wrote to me, come up to Hamum. It's been one year and I am in Hamum and your shipments do not even mention me by name. End quote. And even ones where you see that there's a little bit more of a humane and kind of a, you know, certain amount of just feeling and emotion. Here's one from a concerned wife. Quote, make an effort. Break your obligations there. Our young daughter has grown up. Come home. End quote from another concerned wife and quote when you left you did not leave me any silver not even one shekel you emptied the house and you took everything away what is this extravagance about which you always write to me there is nothing here to buy our food but you think we are extravagant i sent everything we have to you and today i am living in an empty house send me the money you have received from my textiles so i can buy some necessities end quote it is nice knowing that the same civilization that had a word for the shining radiance that flashed forth from a king also just has, like, petty relationship drama. It does help bring back to Earth and remind you that these are people that make this this civilization up. Mm. And I have one more tablet, also from a concerned wife, but, quote, Since you've left, Salem Ahum has built a house double the size. When will we be able to do the same? End quote. <laughs> so next time you make a, a nagging wife joke, it is... A joke formula that's thousands of years old, and maybe you should consider some new material. But um, take my wife, please. Yeah. So, so yeah. So it's nice to have those tablets and that information about the Assyrians, and just to kind of give them a a flavor and a feel that these are real people, and they did live in this time, and they had the same kind of uh, wants and needs and concerns that you or I would have. So, with the fall of the Assyrians, Carl, do you want to go into some of the stats that we have on that battle? Because it's one of the few where we actually have some relatively reliable figures. Yeah, interestingly for this one, it actually felt the result was kind of a foregone conclusion. It had the attackers very much winning this from the get-go. The win over expectation for this battle was only 0.06, so like 90-95% chance the Medes win. Oh, wow! Now, is that simply just because of a, a number advantage or kind of a coalition? Or is this another example of the neural network really favouring horse archers in this situation? Could be all all of those. I think it's a bit of all, but I think horse archers mm-hmm. are worth mentioning because they are one that whenever they pop up in history, pretty much up until you have reliable gunpowder, it's a formula that works really, really well. And you see time and again, yes. and it's normally quite fleeting because... Structurally, it's hard mm-hmm. to maintain an empire based on that, because once you get comfy, you don't want to set, you know, you, you don't have to wander around the steps on your horse anymore, you're, you, so you're not going to be trained for it. But um, whenever a group does get together and gets themselves organized and they have the capability of firing arrows from horses and you don't have any form of, uh, you know, engine based transport and you don't have anything with a better range than bow and arrow, they're going to wreak havoc. All the way. Yeah. As shocking as it might have been a historical event, our neural network, the history machine, believes that you look and you get a couple of horse archers together, you get a bigger army, you get a lot of cavalry, you take on this kind of an army at this time in history, you've got a very high chance of success. Yes, and especially for our database, because it only goes up to zero. Zero. AD. We're not going to encounter any situation where horse archers are, are trumped by anything. 
we won't see that for enough, for quite a long time. So the history machine really doesn't have a, a counter to it in what it's been trained on. So it sees that and just thinks this side will probably win. Mm. Exactly. Other than possibly other horse archers. Yeah. So it doesn't really seem to be too much of, a, of an issue. All right. So the Battle of Nineveh or the Siege of Nineveh, as it's sometimes called, really is an upset historically. But if we look at the actual facts and figures and, and some of the unit types and the composition, the neural network believes, yeah, this should have happened just in terms of it's, it was on the right track. They were able to do it. Let's talk about the group of people. These are the next people on the scene. And it's very important to mention them because if we're going to talk about Persia, we have to talk about the Medes. So, Syraxes, after the fall of the Assyrians, he's going to take over. Now, the Medes historically are going to be, funnily enough, horse nomads. So, we're going to see that the Persians also have a history of horse nomads. And a lot of very powerful civilizations, look at Attila the Hun, the Mongols, the Xiaonu, would settle and become incredibly powerful, very often start as nomadic horse people so the Medes do they're the new civilization that has replaced the Assyrians and has created effectively a power vacuum they will absorb a certain amount of territory they're the new power in Asia funny fact they used to actually provide a lot of the horsepower for the Assyrians for taxes and um, as tribute so a couple of generations later one of their kings Astyages will absorb territories as far as modern day Azerbaijan he's going to focus on switching from being horse people to let's build some palaces. So there's a palace at an area of Ek Batana. This is going to be the stronghold of the Medes and it's going to be transformed from an open pasture to a magnificent, coloured, rich, vibrant, extravagant palace and it's going to be like heavily influenced by other cultures like the Babylonians. It's going to be a huge choke point on the Silk Road or sometimes it's referred to early in this point of history or a section of it at least the Khorasan Highway. No one knows exactly who built it. It's unknown. It's kind of up for debate. But ancient civilizations have used it ever since. And effectively, this palace, this capital of Ekbatana, the stronghold of the Medes, is going to be at like a choke point area for trade. So if you're going to be an ancient merchant traveling through the modern day Middle East, you know, West Asia, you are going to come across this palace. You're going to have to go through it. You're going to have to pay a certain amount of tribute or taxes. So you can imagine that the Medes at this point are going to get fabulously wealthy. This is is now a very heavy choke point. This particular king, Astyages, he's going to have a couple of dreams, a couple of very vivid dreams, and they're going to be about his heirs destroying the world. The first one is he has a dream that an heir is going to flood the world and everyone will drown in it. It's a dream he's trying to interpret and of course he gets a couple of wise men to do it. They're going to go, oh, it means that one of your heirs down the line is going to cause a lot of trouble. And he goes, oh, okay, this is, this is uh, something I need to be concerned about. Next, he's going to have another dream where his daughter is going to sprout vines from her womb and they're going to absorb the world. And the wise men again kind of interpret this as, oh, she's going to have a son and that son's going to threaten the homogeny of, of the Medes and the Median people, wreak havoc to your kingdom and, and destroy everything. So this is where we're going to be introduced to the myth, the legend, the founder of the Achaemenid Persians, Cyrus the Great. Now, probably more realistically, he was possibly just a very influential human being, a charismatic, fantastic, natural ruler, came from a small kingdom, united a couple of tribes together, challenged the uh, Medes, took over and established the Persians. That would probably make sense. And that's probably in kind of the, the Occam's razor, the easiest way to look at it. But the man is so magnificent that he has an almost Superman origin story feel to him. The idea that he's going to be the grandson of the current king of, of the, the Medes. So the story begins that after this point, the king of the Medes, Astyages, sends his daughter off to be married to a lower vassal kingdom, the Persians. This child will be born and he decides that this child is going to be too much of a threat, so you're going to have him killed. So he orders one of his trusty generals, uh, Harpagus, to have the child killed. And Harpagus goes, I don't really want to kill this child. So where do we go from here? So he says, you know what? I'll get a shepherd to kill the child. And the shepherd kind of goes, I don't want to kill this child either. And he switches it with a stillborn baby from his wife and they effectively raise the child as their own. Now that's just one of many origin stories. There are other ones where Cyrus might have, um, he might have been abandoned at a mountain. He might have possibly like Romulus and Ramus been raised by the milk of a dog. 
So he, 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 as I said, the guy is just shrouded in these yeah. crazy origin stories. But long story short, he's noted for a couple of things. A hook nose, immense ambition and near limitless ability. He is this charismatic, truly a great example of the great men of history, the, the theory of the great leaders of history and the great men of history. An outstanding individual and his achievements and what he's going to do next really put him forward in establishing a brand new dynasty, a brand new kingdom, a brand new superpower. Cahal, let's go a little bit into Cyrus the Great, have a look at a couple of his stats and talk about his history and where he's going to go from here. Cyrus the Great, the overview, as you said, there's a lot of a lot of romance and a lot of mythology that goes along with mm-hmm. him. He is a very, very big figure. I think a good example of this is that it is said that he won over 100 battles or participated in over 100 battles. Now, we could find solid data on six. Um, so, like, the truth is probably somewhere in between. It probably was more than six because our historical record is patchy when we're going this far back in history. But it's probably, it probably wasn't a hundred. Or if there were, that probably includes, like, you know, mm-hmm. a few bar fights or a few lads kind of getting into skirmish here and there. Of the six battles, anyway, he is very solid stats. Now, he doesn't stand out as being one of the all-time great generals, according to the History Machine, because I think once the the Persian Empire got going, he was usually the favourite to win. He doesn't Mm -hmm. really show any weaknesses. He had five wins and one draw out of those six battles. Wins over expectation is uh, 0.15, which is good. Not amazing, but good. Didn't take any more casualties than you'd expect. Dealt out about 30% more casualties than you'd expect. In terms of commander kills or commanders lost, it's kind of, you know, negligible either way, so... Very solid, nothing spectacular, but no real weaknesses. Right. So an all-round well-balanced individual. Very well-balanced. That seems to be like the kind of calibre of human being he is in terms of he's definitely a great guy. Now, as we said, he's meant to have 100 battles. We have solid data on six, but we're possibly missing some of his glorious victories or his crowning achievements or something where he really wins against the odds. But we don't have those figures. We don't have those numbers. So we can't, we're only really speculating with that so we kind of have to work with what we have but with what we have actually is kind of reasonable anyway i suppose a good starting off point if we want to talk about some of his big significant battles it's the battle of herba at this point basically cyrus he, he was leading a persian rebellion against the median empire uh Astyages. he sent uh his general harpagus to go quell the rebellion and Harpagus defected to Cyrus' side. So we see here, like, you know, that, as we've said before with the History Machine, it only tracks kind of the base numbers. It doesn't have an idea of strategy or kind of X factors. And one of the real X factors with Cyrus yeah. is that he seemed to be very charismatic because he seems to get people on his side a lot. He's just so beautiful, I gotta join him. What was started out as basically a kind of a provincial rebellion turned into a full-on coup. But um, this battle, I think, is unique in the History Machines database because of Harpagus. He started the battle on one side and finished it on the other. He started against Cyrus and finished it with him. So his stats (laughs) are a bit confused. But um, yes, overall, it considered this a strong performance by Cyrus. It was it was above his average wins over expectation because it was one of the few times maybe he started out as the underdog until he got the enemy army to partially defect. Win over expectation in this one for him was uh, about 0.37. Okay, so that's pretty good. And he dealt out about 70% more casualties than expected. So that's the real standout. That's And that's way above average for him. So so this is just like a real massacre of a battle in this, in this particular era. Now, I want to actually mention a side note here because it's something that the Greeks mention, but, you know, we got to really have to take all of that with a pinch of salt because we don't know if this is propaganda, if it's follow-up, or if it's just a good kind of Superman, you know, episode of a comic strip supposedly harpagus was meant to have been the general who is responsible for having cyrus the great killed as a child and upon hearing that it wasn't actually properly carried out astyages pretends not to be annoyed he pretends to kind of go a whole oh i'm really sad that i nearly killed my grandson i didn't we discovered that this persian nobility child this this person he's he's very impressive and he looks kind of like me and he's an outstanding person and there will be a dinner or a banquet and astyages will as punishment serve harpagus his own son 
Uh, so he'll cook a meal, serve it to him, and he then shows him the the extra remains of his son's head and hands and feet uh, brought to him in kind of like a platter. And it's noted that Harpicus at this point then takes the remains and brings them home, possibly to bury them. But once again, that could be fabrication. That could be total, you know, myth. It could just be a fantastic story. It could also help explain why Harpicus defected. Yeah, I think it, it gets the point across that he was not a popular ruler, basically. You know, if it, yes. It, yeah. it may not be true, <laughs> but yeah. this was not a well-liked man. And you could see maybe yes. why Cyrus had, you know, a surprisingly easy time getting people to join his rebellion. Now, we mentioned at the start about the Assyrians and the Medes. They all are very early empires and they seem to rule by the Machiavellian idea of it's better to be feared than loved. That they rule with an iron fist. Everything is about if you try anything bad, we're going to punish you. We're going to kill everybody. We're going to move everything. We're going to flay people alive. We're going to starve people in a desert. We're going to... It, everything is, is shock and awe and destruction. Now, with this in mind... Cyrus is almost like a prototype for the other option, the other side of the Machiavellian coin, the other idea. Let's try and be loved as opposed to feared. Now, I'm going to do a little bit of just a little bit of mentioning here. If you ticked off the Persians at this point, they are going to kill everybody, salt the earth, biblical levels of destruction. They're going to wreck your day. They're going to destroy everything. But at this point, Cyrus and his descendants will kind of be noted for leniency. There'll be areas of this part of the world that are cowed and remember the tyranny of the Assyrians and the Medes. But this time, it's like, listen, you can have your own government, you can do your own thing, you just got to pay taxes and put. let us have a satrap, which is like a governor, in your area. It'll all run smoothly. And hey, send us a couple of troops every now and then. We're all one part of one really big, nice Persian empire. And it's all about trade. It's all about commerce. It's all about flow of information. Everything is absolutely wonderful. That's a great way to rule. But betray us and we'll bring an army down and crush you. So... This is like almost an experimental type of empire rule at this point. They're going to try the carrot approach as opposed to the stick. It's going to show to be quite effective. I'm just going to put that out there right now. It's going to show to be quite effective. I suppose, yeah, it's a little bit of the uh, Teddy Roosevelt, you know, speak softly and carry a big stick style of diplomacy where like, you know, if you don't provoke us, if you kind of, if you're willing to go with our empire and join it peacefully, Mm -hmm. grand, cool, happy out, if you betray us, you know, as I said, that last battle, that was, what, 70% more casualties dealt out than the history machine expected? Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's going to be pretty brutal if you oppose them. Yes. But yeah. if you don't, you know, you might even get to keep your old job. You never know. We'll move on a little bit here with Cyrus. So after the Medes have been destroyed, another power vacuum has effectively been created. And he's going to slug it out with the king of Lydia. So let's have a look at the Battle of Teria. Now, this is going to be a fight to a draw. But let's have a look at some of the stats. Yeah, and I think this is this is an interesting one to look into because it was Cyrus's only draw that we have in the database, which and it doesn't look great, but it shows us again kind of some of the limitations of the history machine, but some of the interesting things that can happen, you know, in the aftermath, say. Now this battle was brutal. As I said, it was between the Lydians who were say, you know, modern day Western Turkey type area. Yes. Um, and the Persian, the fairly new at this stage, Persian Empire. And this battle was bloody. Uh, History Machine has, you know, Cyrus aside, dealing about 70% over expectation, while they themselves are being dealt 40% more casualties over expectation. So both sides taking a hammering. And as I mentioned, Cyrus's stats overall, he doesn't tend to take huge casualties. So this was a real outlier for him. So really, while, you know, both sides were just wiped out in this, this was probably encouraging for the Lydians because they thought like, well, you know what? There's no way, you know, Cyrus, he'll have to take the winter off. We can regroup. He'll have to regroup. You know, we can we can maybe kind of reinforce this border here because there's no way that Cyrus can can come back and hit us after this because we've just done too much damage to him. So King Croesus decided, you know what? You know, disband most of the army. We can take the winter off. It'll be a while recovering. And of course, uh, famous story, he also had a bit of confidence because he had visited the Oracle at Delphi before this battle. And now we have one of the most infamous predictions of the Oracle of Delphi ever that declared, if King Croesus crosses the Halles River, a great empire will be destroyed. 
and <laughs> interpret that whatever way the hell you want. <laughs> and it's pretty vague. It's like, mm. what's going on here? But it's, oh no, the sweet irony. The empire turned out to be me, not my enemies. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah, that brings us nicely to a point where we got to say the history machine records tactical information. It records tactical victories, tactical ability, tactical scoring. But this is a stroke of strategic genius by Cyrus, where instead of, and this is a little bit the thing that just generally happened, your army goes home for the winter. You send your, your vassals, go home to their kingdom, people go to whatever, you, you, you wait it out and you're going to come back and fight again next year. But he decides, I will not disband my army, I'll wait for Croesus to disband most of his, and then we will go and effectively invade the kingdom of Lydia and take the battle to them at the Battle of Thembria. Yeah, and so this one is very straightforward, according to the history machine, because one army had disbanded beforehand <laughs> and was scrabbling to get themselves together. The other had not. And even, yes. you know, this one, it, it considered the wins over expectation less than 0.1. So it was like, you know, again, more than 90% chance that Cyrus is going to win this thing. Mm -hmm. It also says the casualties dealt over expectation was only about 14% higher by Cyrus on the Lydians. And the Lydians lost almost all their army. So it went like, they are probably, the history machine basically looked at this and said, the Lydians are probably going to get more or less wiped out in this. Oh, wow. And when they were, it just wasn't surprised. These things happen. <laughs> like, um, just a little bit of a note as well to mention about this battle. We don't know much about these battles in terms of the overall strategy, possibly how they were particularly deployed. It's mostly figures and numbers. But one tactic that was meant to be employed by Cyrus at this was he was expecting a very heavy cavalry charge by the Lydians. And he decided to incorporate some camels into the army. And when the cavalry charge came, the camels and the smell kind of spooked the Lydian cavalry. And that cavalry charge kind of fizzled. And with that, they capitalized on it. It became no contest. So it's just a little bit of a note I'd like to throw in there because, you know, as I said, we don't know too much about these ones. It's just at that awkward teenage area of history where writing's around, but enough of it has been destroyed. There's scratches in notebooks, but, you know, they didn't stand the test of time. So with that in mind, we don't have too much else on Cyrus. And we're going to finish up with him in a little bit here. But I want to mention a couple of things about him. One, undeniably, he has to be a phenomenal character. You see these guys appear in history every now and then. For example, like Alexander the Great considers Cyrus the Great his idol, just in terms of, oh, I really think he's cool. Don't like the Persians, but I love him. He's, he's a fantastic <laughs> person. <laughs> yeah, so Alexander would idolise this, and considering the amount of people who idolise Alexander, it's, it's pretty crazy. He, he has this wonderful feel of, like, the first, the first real big fantastic individual one that, like one of the first real standout people in history that you have myths and legends yeah. about him he has a s similar feel and air to him of Ramses II Ozymandias yeah so it, it is particularly difficult like some of these earlier figures to get enough data to properly hammer these guys down and pin it pin it correctly and give us some solid information. But after this point, we're going to have a couple of more battles with Cyrus. He's going to die at some point, approximately the age of 70, which is very old in, in the ancient world. Uh, he may have been killed by invading another society of horse archers and died in that battle. His body may or may not have been recovered in that regards. His head may have been cut off and used as a drinking cup. Or he might have just died in his sleep. So there's loads of conflicting information on what exactly happens to him. He just disappears from history in a sense. But he is such a powerful footnote and like a stamp on history and history in this area of the world. It's impossible to ignore him. It's impossible to belittle his achievements. And he's really one of the first great conquerors the kind of person like a Genghis Khan or an Alexander the Great that within one lifetime they will conquer crazy amounts of territory and this would have been like up till its point in history the largest empire that had been seen yes as well you know it it, it would be a while before someone else would come it was you know Alexander and Alexander was basically recreating that empire plus 
Plus a little bit of Greece. Plus a little bit of India. The, he just extended basically this empire a little bit. Yeah, it, it really is. It is comparable and probably would be talked about more if they wrote down a bit more and more of that writing survived. And maybe two if they're a little bit more Western and Eurocentric. And of course, yeah. It's another, another little issue we can have sometimes when we're trying to get information for this podcast. Uh, this brings us to a little bit of an interesting past now because... There's a phrase that says, find me a great man who's the son of a great man. And it's the sense of it's a very hard thing to do. If the shadow stretches so far, if the light shines so bright, if the figure is just so unbelievably goddamn brilliant at everything they do, you have a lot to live up with if you're the son of Cyrus the Great. Cambyses is going to be the son who's going to inherit this new empire. His claim to fame is he's going to defeat the Egyptians. He's going to deal out massive casualties. Let's see what the history machine thinks of Cambyses, the son of Cyrus. We'll go a little bit further into his his story and his information later. But let's look just at some of the raw stats first. So, Cahal, could you tell us about the Battle of Pelusium? As we're saying, record is patchy. So this is the only battle we have decent information for on Cambyses in our database. Mm-hmm. But it is solid. And in terms of just generalship, he seems to be doing a solid job living up to his father's name. History Machine considered this to be a roughly 50-50 battle. So 50%, Mm -hmm. 0.5 wins over expectation for this battle alone, which is very solid. And 0.73 casualties dealt over expectation, which I think is slightly higher than the the best Cyrus ever did. Uh, If you consider that better, you know, I guess it's a matter of opinion if slaughtering... More people than you need to is is better. But uh, yeah, he's he's certainly a strong job. And, you know, conquering Egypt is uh, a good benchmark for any of the classic empires, I think. Yeah, it's a nice it's it's a nice little thing to add to the belt buckle, regardless of uh, it's 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 definitely one of those like lifetime achievement awards, like like winning a Tony and an Oscar and a Grammy. You know, it's conquering Egypt. That's you know, that's what elevates you to the level of an Alexander or (laughs) or a Caesar. Yeah, Napoleon, you know, it, it just it puts you on an extra level. Now, as I said, we don't have much information about a lot of these battles, but what we do have is a lot of speculative gossip of the history of what happens. So likely Cambyses was a very good ruler, a solid person, quite tactically good, not as good as his father and extended the empire a little bit further. But the gossip version of Cambyses is that he's a madman, is that uh, he dies by stabbing himself in the leg with a sword and becomes infected. And there you go. We don't have modern medicine. You're going to die. And also that he killed his brother Bartia somewhere down the line. We never really mentioned Bartia, but Bartia is the next in line. And Bartia gets a small mini prize, like a little mini kingdom of his own to rule. So it's like, you're not going to get the empire, but here you got a small kingdom. You don't pay us tax. Have a nice life. There you go. The thought is that Cambyses, in his kind of mad, crazed ways, thought everyone's going to want to have Bartia take over. So if I kill Bartia and then I tell nobody about it, they won't be able to use him as a usurper. So at a point, Cambyses dies due to like a stab in the leg and he gets that infection. And Bartia then is going to be announced as the next king. So it gets a little bit sketchy around here because... (laughs) There's an official story and there's probably what likely happened. So I'm going to tell you the probably what likely happened. There's a fellow who's going to be the next ruler, Darius, along with six other co-conspirators, very powerful nobility in Persia. They have choice positions in the empire. Many of them served under Cambyses, for example. There's actually a potential rumor that Darius might have killed Cambyses in, you know, like a small accident, something like that. Now that's total speculation. Long story short, they were like, you know who should really get the empire? It should be us. So they kind of do a little bit of a a black ops mission where they're going to go to Bartia, uh, go into his palace, find him in his bedroom with a concubine of his, and then brutally stab to death a man who's, who is naked and trying to fight them off with a broken stool. So that's probably what happened. It's very unromantic. It's quite believable in a brutal kind of way. <laughs> and, and it does reinforce the whole, you start out with Cyrus with this epic career and then dies in battle age 70. And now we're down to naked, trying to fight people off with a stool. Two stages removed. <laughs> so it's, it's going downhill a little bit quickly. <laughs> now the official story, Jesus Christ, the official story is, uh, 
It turns out that wasn't Bartia. That wasn't the guy next in line. Now, there's a chance that this was was properly Bartia, but it was meant to be that Cambyses killed Bartia, and this man is an imposter. It's it's the Paul is dead of ancient Persia. Um, if anyone's familiar with Beatles mythology. <laughs> He was replaced by an imposter. <laughs> Didn't want to admit he had died. Um, yeah, pretty much. And this imposter is meant to be like a wizard. And a wizard who's like a shape-shifting wizard. This this is the official yeah. story now. A shape-shifting, a shape-shifting wizard who has taken on the form of Bartia. But he is discovered by one of his concubines when she lovingly touches the side of his head and finds there is an ear. But little did the shape-shifting wizard know that Bartia had an ear cut off in a battle years ago. So he imitated that ear without possibly knowing. And she informed these Magnificent Seven, this uh, this super SWAT team of nobles, and it was their duty to go in, find and destroy this imposter Bartia. And then later on the line, when they have him killed, they're going to ride off into the sunset. And when dawn comes up, the first horse that neighs will be the person who is now the new leader of Persia. So that's the official proper story. And the other one is naked fight with a bar stool and some daggers. So so believe whichever one you want to believe. They're both ridiculous in their own way. So whichever one you believe, you're going to have fun with it. I'm, I, I think I'm going to believe the one that doesn't have magic uh, or possibly there, there's a combination of different stories. Maybe the person was an imposter. I doubt he was exactly a shape-shifting magic wizard, but um, let's, let's not rule that off the table just yet. But, <laughs> but uh, long story short, it does end up resulting that Darius, this noble, he would have connections to different Persian nobility. He's going to take over. And Darius is effectively now going to administer the empire, focus very heavily on trade. He's going to consolidate the gains that have happened and stabilize succession. So these seven nobles who are involved in this plot, their descendants are going to have key and critical positions within the empire. So it does seem like that was a messy coup, but it was definitely a coup in a sense of those involved really heavily profited. So Darius has a relatively interesting career. We don't have proper information on Darius himself, but what we do have speaks well, I think, to his ability to administer and delegate, because one of the generals underneath him, Datus, has six battles in the database, which is quite high, especially for maybe not the biggest name. He has five wins, and he's he has, uh, the, in fact, the highest wins over expectation of any of the Persian generals in our database. Oh, wow. Point two. On average. For, for every five battles, he'd win an extra one. Funny enough, he does have five out of six wins. <laughs> uh, <laughs> in addition to this, uh, his casualties dealt over expectation is about 50% higher mm-hmm. than what you'd expect. So that's almost twice what you got out of Cyrus. So very, very strong. Wow. And uh, yeah, no, no real weaknesses. There are other generals maybe with more spectacular stats than him. Kind of like, again, like Cyrus, but however... No big spikes. Yeah. However, Dadis, uh, the one loss that he does have in our database out of those six battles, that's a pretty significant one because that was the Battle of Marathon. Probably probably heard the Creeks talk about <laughs> <Yeah>. it. <laughs> but um, yeah. Uh, I do want to mention a little bit of a side note as well. The Greeks will very often refer to the Persians at this time as Medes. Now, the kind of reason is the Assyrians had ruled for about 2,000 years. The Medes took over for several centuries. And then it's like an exponential decline. Within 60 years... You go from the Medes were here to the Persians have control everything. So it's almost like the Ionian Greeks. So these would be the Greeks near the area of Turkey were kind of like, I thought those guys were Medes, but they're Persians. I think they're one and the same. I don't really know. I'm quite confused. All I do know is that the Persians are in control of this area right now. But they're, they're kind of Medes. They're related to them. I'm not fully sure. So it's, it's just that when you, when you look at the Greeks talking about them, they will refer to the Persians very often as Medes. Now there's a chance that effectively a lot of the Medians intermarried into the Persians and vice versa and you have a certain amount of connection but the sheer lightning bolt of conquering that Cyrus the Great will bring will be confusing to the Greeks. They'll just be like oh wow this is kind of strange that this guy just came along and took the whole place over. It's 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 a little bit of an anomaly. It's just crazy. With that in mind uh, Darius as, as we mentioned we had the Battle of Marathon 
this is going to be, according to the Greeks anyway, so take this with a little bit of pinch of salt, this is going to be something that Darius is going to be reminded every day at lunch. Like, don't forget <laughs> the Athenians. you got to punish them. That's something you got to do. Now, it might have been a case of it's something so insignificant. He's like, oh, yeah, I better not forget about that. Or it might have been something where it's like, oh, they gave you such a crushing defeat. You have to remember to, to destroy them. You, you know, they're, they're in open rebellion. They're terrible people. We have to stick it to the Athenians. So, yeah, Datus has the loss at Marathon, which is very unfortunate for him. Otherwise, he would have had a fantastic career. Well, he seemed to have a great career anyway. So we mentioned the Battle of Marathon. We did cover it in our Greek episode, but we'll just pull up some of the stats again, just as a friendly reminder. This is a bit of an upset. Just for a refresher, and keep in mind Datus, he's established at this point, he had five wins out of five battles up to this point in our database. He was a very strong general, and he was given a 75% chance to win this battle. He blew it. So um, this was an embarrassment, really, for the Persians. They went in as heavy favorites and just, yeah, it it fell apart for them. Mm. So um, with with a competent general, with like a strong background, it came out of nowhere. And uh, I mean, a a certain amount of the account comes, you know, it comes from the Greeks. So obviously there's going to be a bit of propaganda in there, but. However way you spin it, this was not a good result for the Persians. Yeah, fair enough. So it, it just it just did not work out for them in the end. So after Darius, we're going to kind of tie up right now for the Achaemenid Persians and have a little bit of a summary of them in general. The Greeks get involved. We're going to have the famous Battle of Thermopylae, the 300. We're going to have the Battle of Plataea. They're not going to be absorbed into the Persian Empire. The Persians then have this long chain of history of a lot of rulers and assassinations and murders and it's 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 kind of game of thronesy in terms of intriguing they might be conquering other areas they might be consolidating their strength they could be working on building projects there's a lot happening that we don't know so there's a little bit of a fog of history here we don't really have much information and along the line then we're going to have our alexander the great who we've mentioned in a previous episode dedicated to himself is going to burn this place down conquer it up so I think we'll wrap it up here and we're going to focus very heavily on Cyrus the Great and some of the other rulers and we're going to give a couple of honourable mentions but I want to say before we go any further that this is an incredibly impressive empire. We don't have too much information on it. We don't have the raw data we would like to work with but we just kind of had to mention them for cultural and historical reasons. The same way that we mentioned the Assyrians, the same way we mentioned the Medes, the same way that we talk about Egypt but Egypt has more information they're just too important they're stepping stones in history that cannot be ignored and it is a pillar of civilization it is a pillar of militarization it's the starting point when we look at like the cyrus the great the great men of history the real super conquerors the guys who come from you know, apparently nothing worked their whole way all the way to the top. They unite their tribes. They pull it all together over all odds. This charismatic, fantastic, larger than life human being conquers everything. And then their ancestors mess it up down the line. Um, He just has to be mentioned. And the Persians have to be addressed when we're talking about this podcast before we go further into history, when we have more information. So Cahal, let's look, if we don't mind, at five figures from history, from these regions, that really stand out in what information we have in the database and what the history machine thinks of them. So, coming in at number five. Worst to best figure mentioned in this episode, Astyages, the unpleasant king who will make you eat your son if he thinks you betrayed him. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) He had just under minus 0.2 wins over expectation. Significantly worse than average. Not the worst ever, but like he's bad. And the casualties sustained over expectation. He takes about 60% more casualties per battle than you'd expect. So this really is a guy that you, you can see why there is a belly. You can see why they wanted to get rid of him. He was not terribly competent. You can see why people defected to Cyrus. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah, they put their faith in the new up and coming kid and he was a lot better than this guy. All right, so let's look at our number four then. So number four, and also the next person that we came across to oppose Cyrus was Croesus of Lydia. Only a couple of battles in the database. Now, he did get that one draw, that, that blemish on Cyrus's record, but he was not great either. His, his wins over expectations, it's close to zero. Uh, his casualties dealt very high. It's about 
45% more than you'd expect, but at the same time, the casualties sustained is 60% more than you'd expect. Yeah, he's he's just bloody. He really is. He's, uh, you know, using boxing analogies. This is the guy who just decides, screw it, let's turn this into a coin flip, just go in, all the guns blazing, and he might get knocked out or he might knock you out. He's trading shots. So the guy famous for the prediction that a great empire will fall, turns out that was him. So good luck. Sorry, Croesus, just did not work out for you. All right, so coming in then, please, at number three. Number three, and this is an awkward one, is Harpagus, the general who defected to Cyrus Great and kind of Mm -hmm. took him under his wing a bit as well. He's, He's an interesting figure. He seems to have been quite an important advisor to Cyrus. But History Machine only considers his wins over expectation about 0.1 over expectation um so nothing too special he deals out a lot of casualties 40 percent more than expected but takes about 20 percent more than expected to but again this is complicated because he was a general for both sides in one of his battles yeah yeah it, it, it gets messy the history machine got a bit confused about how to calculate for him i think he is probably underrated but even even with all that confusion he still comes out reasonably okay but it is possibly that a lot of his stats get cancelled out by one another because of that defection. Yeah. All right. So our number two then on the list. Our number two, who I'm sure wouldn't be happy to be called number two, is Cyrus the Great himself. (laughs) Uh, Six six battles, five five wins, one draw. Point one five wins over expectation. So, you know, good, solid, but we have had more spectacular generals in the past, definitely. Especially because... Sometimes think normally when you when you get it up to six battles, that's a lot more than the average general has. Very few have that many. And at that stage, you yes. get a better idea of where they really are. He was obviously very good, but beyond the first couple of battles, he really always was the heavy favorite. So he just couldn't put up those spectacular wins you'd get from others. It hasn't really approved his, his results. Yeah, he, he was never quite the underdog again. Now, I will mention, as we said, Six out of potentially a hundred battles have been mm. recorded here with what we've got that that has enough data that we're like, we'll put them in. We're skewed very heavily on a small population of data. He could have had much more spectacular wins. He could have more consistent wins that could bring up his number. So he's sitting here at number two, but he might be number one if we had more information. But you know what? We're going to leave him here at number two because that's what our information has got for us right now. I'll also mention, we've mentioned it earlier, History Machine records tactical ability. Now, the idea is this man is definitely a strategic genius as well. In a sense of, you know, he was the kind of guy who goes, I'm not going to disband my army. I'm going to march on the other people. It's very unconventional. A lot of changes, a lot of high-minded thinking, a lot of empire consolidation. And similar to a lot of like big conquerors and first emperors, he's going to be remembered as like the best man ever of his society, of his empire people think when they say who was the best emperor of rome a lot of people say augustus because he was the first and it seems to be that the guy who's able to establish everything and put it there in place and grow it from very little and unite it tends to get a lot of credit because it's his successors that come along and your only job is to not screw it up is to not fall make it fall apart you don't have to grow it you don't have to do anything else just consolidate with what you have and as Cyrus, in terms of a tactical ability, is great here. Like, he's doing better than everybody else before this list. But it's definitely a combination of his well-rounded ability. I would not be surprised, based on the stats we have for him that show him that he's well-rounded tactically, that he was well-rounded um, strategically and probably politically, and so many other attributes, that he's possibly a, a fantastic example of one of these people who's just really good everything like a polymath like somebody who could just get the job done and is able to like is able to properly do it and i think just even based on his history it sounds great he does have that super superman feel to him like literally he would identify as an aryan which you know we're saying a, a phrase that has not gone down historically well in the 20th century but when you think of aryan it's meant to be from the caucasus region and the modern day iranians as in people from iran would actually derive the word Iranian from Aryan. So that'll that'll show you the kind of the connection between them. He is in the conscious of the modern Middle East. He is their Alexander the Great, their Julius Caesar all rolled into one. So he's sitting here at number two, but he's got it 
you know, he, he's got that X factor, that wow, that oomph. So let's talk about the guy who knocks him off the pedestal in terms of tactical ability. Our number one, please, Colin. So the number one, according to the History Machine, was Datus with five wins out of six battles, 0.2 wins over expectation, and 50% casualties dealt over expectation. And I guess he, he is, you know, it's, it's important to big up Cyrus, but it's important to remember as well, like, we always hear about the Persians from the Greek side. And, you know, Datus, this was when they were starting to, to conquer the Greeks and everything. Yes. And it is, it, it is that big historical what if, like, we could have a totally different view of history and history could be totally different now if, he, if that last battle, that one loss, had gone differently and had gone the way maybe it was expected to go. You always hear the, you know, I suppose the Greek what was propaganda against the Persians, but it just reminds you, like, he was very competent. They could have easily had a resurgence had things gone differently. And uh, it's it's an interesting figure to look into. You know, overshadowed by Darius, who's the overall emperor at the time, but uh, a very strong general and primarily admiral, which also may contribute to his wins over expectation because the history machine always finds naval battles a bit more unpredictable. We talk a lot about the great, you know, the kind of long, steady decline after Cyrus. They did have points in history where they could have turned it around and turned turned that decline around and, and kind of ramped back up again as an empire. Yeah, definitely. All right. So we're wrapped up now for this episode and um, we're going to just call it quits for the Achaemenid Persians for now. I'm sure as the database increases over time, we're going to come back to other empires in this area that would identify as Persian, but would not necessarily be the Achaemenid Persians, but would effectively be the successors, uh, potentially the ancestors and the inheritors of these great names and these territories in the world. Think of the Parthians. So we're going to come back to that later. Uh, somewhere down the line, we'll, we'll definitely come to it. But we had to really mention the Achaemenid Persians in this episode and Cyrus the Great because of just how influential they are in history. It just it, We could not possibly ignore them. With that in mind, looking at a small empire that starts off as a small kingdom, works its way up and conquers the area around it. For our next episode, we're going to focus on Rome. And we're going to focus on the old Republic Rome, the early Rome. The one that starts off as a city-state, conquers the area around it, and eventually becomes a controller of roughly modern-day Italy. Because we've got more writing, more information, more names, more history, more things that are just saved and passed on, we can look at a very similar growth, but this time in detail. So our Datus and our Cyrus's and our um, Syraxes and our Harpicuses and all of these other people here that are really influential and set the bar for, you know, empire building. We're going to look at another empire more to the West that has more information on it and really be able to look at it in more detail and go more further into the figures. So we'll be looking forward to that. This is going to be the Rome, the Old Republic. Long before the time of Julius Caesar, long before the time of Augustus and emperors, this is going to be the ramp up from, you know, start new game, work your way up. This is Rome the city, not the Ro- Rome the empire, essentially. Exactly, yeah. So, all right, with all of that in mind, thank you very, very much for listening to us. Uh, thanks for all of the downloads and listens we've had. We've had quite a few actually in the last few months. Um, I'd like to say thank you as well to a group of people who effectively helped in our bonus episode on Game of Thrones validated the information we had had and that is behind the iron throne podcast but just want to give a shout out to them because they did actually help us quite a bit in putting together some information for our last bonus episode thanks very much for your time i've been niall and i've been Cahill. and we'll catch you again soon for the next episode on rome